Hello girls, I gladly welcome you to the fourth part of the lecture on Edgar Allan Poe's famous short story, The Purloin Letter. In the last lecture, we had begun the story and we had talked about all the attempts made by the chief of Paris police in order to look for that Purloin Letter and how ultimately he was even ready to pay quite a huge sum of money to anybody who was who would have been able to procure that letter for him dupin makes him sign a check for an amount of 50000 francs and we just learn that he hands over the letter to the prefect moving on we see that the prefect of the Paris police is surprised when Dupin produces the letter that he was looking for since so many months. This functionary grasped it in a perfect agony of joy, opened it with a trembling hand, cast a rapid glance at its contents, and then, scrambling and struggling to the door, rushed at length unceremoniously from the room and from the house without having uttered a syllable since Dupin had requested him to fill up the check. So the functionary refers to Monsieur G, the prefect of the Paris police, who is trying to look for the letter and even he actually gets the letter, he is quite surprised. He is so stupefied that he uh, does not even have words to utter out of his mouth and he struggles to the door and leaves without even speaking to Dupin after handing him, him the check over. When he had gone, my friend entered into some explanations. So the narrator, a friend of Dupin, is quite curious. And Dupin uh, lets the narrator know, or his friend know, how he had got about uh, getting that letter from the possession of Minister D. The Parisian police, he said, these are the words of Dupin, are exceedingly able in their view. They are persevering ingenious, very original, cunning and thoroughly versed in the knowledge which the duties seem chiefly to demand. Thus, when G detailed to us his mode of searching the premises at the Hotel D, I felt entire confidence in his having made a satisfactory investigation so far as his labours extended. So Dupin goes on to explain the narrator uh, how he knew the modus operandi or the way in which the Parisian police works and he was completely convinced with their thorough search and the way that they had searched uh, the residence of Minister D. Yes, said Dupin, the measures adopted were not only the best of their kind, the kind of searching that they were doing, but carried out to absolute perfection. Had the letter been deposited within the range of their search, these fellows would beyond a question have found it. So Dupin believes that whatever work that they had done, they had done it very diligently. The Paris police had done a commendable job. And if the letter would have been uh, hidden in the manner in which they were trying to search, then they would have definitely chanced upon that letter. But the problem with the Paris police was that they had underestimated their enemy, Minister D. I merely laughed, but he seemed quite serious in all that he said. The measures then, he continued, were good in their kind and well executed. Their defect lay in their being inapplicable to the case and to the man. So this is where the Paris police had faulted. Like the way that they had adopted in order to look for the letter was quite uh, fitting for any, it would have been quite fitting for any other case. But here, considering uh, the minister to be a simple person or uh, even perfects judgment about minister to be a kind of a fool because he was a poet, you know, uh, acts as a kind of demerit or it pulls down their investigation because for any other criminal, their uh, way of searching the house for the letter would have worked. 
but with this minister who was a very clever person they should have changed their way in which they were looking for that purloined letter a certain set of highly ingenious resources are with the prefect a sort of procrustean bed to which he forcibly adapts his designs now the reference which has been made to the procrustean bed uh, it is actually edgar allan poe's way of using a device called as an aphorism now what exactly is an aphorism an aphorism is uh, usually you know short phrases that express in a clever way something that is actually true so when he makes the reference of that procrustean bed saying that a certain uh, set of highly ingenious resources are with the prefect a sort of a procrustean bed to which he forcibly adapts his design basically what he was trying to say was that uh, the prefect has resources uh, but uh, his uh, way of working is uh, too narrow his mind is too narrow now there is a background story which is linked with this particular phrase called as the procrustean bed in greek mythology there was a man who was known as procrustes okay and uh, he was known to be a very cruel owner of a small estate uh, it's a kind of a small hotel uh, which was uh, situated near the city of athens now procrustes had a very peculiar a very very weird sense of hospitality what he used to do was that he used to abduct you know kidnap travelers and after abducting them he provided them with lavish generous dinners and afterwards uh, he always invited them to spend the night in a special bed but the problem with procrustes was that he wanted the bed to fit the travelers and not the other way around okay so all those travelers who were very tall what was done was that their legs were chopped off or it was you know hatched off with a sharp hatchet so that the travelers fit the bed and similarly those travelers who were too short they were stretched uh, to fit the bed so basically uh, what edgar allan poe was trying to point out was that uh, just like procrustes uh, tried to fit their travelers to the certain specifications or size of a bed the same mistake was being committed by monsieur g as well like he was failing to think out of the box like he uh, should be thinking in a direction which is completely new completely different from the way in which they have solved cases in the past okay so that was the reference with the procrustean bed uh he further says but he perpetually errs makes mistake by being too deep or too shallow for the matter in hand and many a school boy is a better reasoner than he he talks about how he can improve and what is the mistake that he is making what are the mistakes that he has already made he gives him an example and he talks about a school boy i knew one about 8 years of age so there was a young school boy whose success at guessing in the game of even and odd attracted universal admiration so there is this game of guessing uh, if the marble that is being shuffled is in odd number or is in even number he talks about the game this game is simple and is played with marbles one player holds in his hand a number of these toys and demands of another whether that number is even or odd so a person uh, tries to you know shuffle the marble behind their back and the person in front of them is supposed to guess how many marbles are present in his hand whether that number is odd or whether that number is even if the guess is right the guesser wins one if wrong he loses one the boy to whom i allude won all marbles of the school so that boy was uh, quite sharp and he had successfully won all the marbles from the other boys and there was a method that he used which was interesting and which dupin wants to refer to 
Of course, he had some principle of guessing and lay in mere observation and admeasurement of the astuteness of his opponents. Now, how did he succeed? For example, an arrant simpleton is his opponent and holding up his closed hand asks, are they even or odd? So, if a person comes up to him and asks him after holding up or shuffling the marbles, if the marbles are even number or odd number, a schoolboy replies odd and loses. But upon the second trial, he wins for he then says to himself, the simpleton had them even upon the first trial and his amount of cunning is just sufficient to make him have them odd upon the second. I will therefore guess odd. He guesses odd and wins. Now with a simpleton, a degree above the first, he would have reasoned thus. This fellow finds that in the first instance I guessed odd and in the second he will propose to himself upon the first impulse a simple variation from even to odd as did the first simpleton. But then a second thought will suggest that this is too simple a variation and finally he will decide upon putting it even as before. I will therefore guess even guesses and wins. Now this mode of reasoning in the schoolboy whom his fellows termed lucky, what in its last analysis is it? It is merely, I said, an identification of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent. In simple terms, what Dupin was trying to say is that the schoolboy was always able to win or, you know, able to guess how many number of marbles, be it in even uh, number or odd number, he was able to guess this correctly because he was a good judge of the intellect of his opponent. Uh, what I mean to say is that he was able to guess as to how his opponent is thinking. He used to put himself in the shoes of his opponent and think like him and that actually made him succeed. And this is what the narrator also picks up on. That it is an identification of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent. It is. So, uh, the skill of observation needs to be very on point. It is, said Dupin, and upon inquiring of the boy by what means he affected the thorough identification in which his success consisted, I received answer as follows. So, Dupin had questioned him, how do you do it? When I wish to find out how wise or how stupid or how good or how wicked is anyone or what are his thoughts at the moment, I fashion the expression of my face as accurately as possible in accordance with the expression of his. Okay, so in order to guess the level of intellect of his opponent, what the schoolboy tried to do was that he tried to imitate the facial expression of his opponent so that he can get in the same mind frame as accurately as possible in accordance with the expression of his and then wait to see what thoughts or sentiments arise in my mind or heart as if to match or correspond with the expression. So when he changed his expression of his own face in accordance with the face of his opponent, there would be certain thoughts and sentiments which would you know, guide him in making the decision whether one should choose odd or whether one should choose even. This response of the schoolboy lies at the bottom of all spurious profundity which has been attributed to Rochefoucauld, to La Bougive, to Machiavelli and to Campanella. In simple terms, we just need to understand that the schoolboy was able to succeed because he knew how to predict the other boys' you know, behavior according to their intellect. So the boy basically claimed that he mimicked the other boy's expression or his opponent's expression uh, in doing so and he found uh, the answer to what was going on in his opponent's mind. Dubin basically compares the schoolboy to famous thinkers like Machiavelli. A narrator moves on and he says and the identification I said of the reasoner's intellect with that of his opponent depends if I understand you 
or right upon the accuracy with which the opponent's intellect is admeasured. So here what the narrator brings our attention to is that uh, Dupin's intelligence is his understanding of many different kinds of people to the extent that he seems to inhabit their minds. This is how he was able to solve the case of the Pauline letter. Uh, because, uh, you know, he was able to identify and mimic the thoughts of the minister, probably, just like uh, the schoolboy did with his opponent. So in a similar fashion, he has been able to solve the case of the Pauline letter. Dupin, basically, what he does is that he puts himself in the shoes of the minister and tries to think like the minister, so that he is able to figure out where he must have hidden that letter which he had purloined from the Boudoir, that famous lady. For this, sorry, for its practical value, it depends upon this, replied Dupin, and the prefect and his cohort fall so frequently, first by default of this identification, and secondly by ill admeasurement, or rather through non admeasurement of the intellect with which they are engaged. So, this is one very important point. Uh, the reason why Monsieur G or the prefect of the Paris police had failed was because they had, uh, you know, very early on, since very early, they had underestimated the intellect or the cleverness of Minister D. Dupin was able to solve the case because he never considered Minister D to be a foolish man and he respected his intellect and he knew uh, what that man was capable of. Dupin says uh, they consider only their own ideas of ingenuity and in searching for anything hidden, adverted only to modes in which they would have hidden it. So Minister, uh, Monsieur G, the mistake that he was committing was that he only looked for places in which he would have hidden the letter he never considered looking in those places in which the minister would have hidden the letter right and that is what Dupin did that is why he was able to solve the case they are right in this much that their own ingenuity is a faithful representative of that mass but when the cunning of the individual felon is diverse in character from their own the felon foils them, of course. The felon over here is the criminal or minister D. And Dubin actually lets the readers know that uh, there is something about the mind of the criminal that fascinates him. Okay? And he was fascinated with the mind of that minister. And that is why his uh, way or method of approaching the investigation was completely different. This always happens when it is above their own. So the minister was basically much more cleverer than Monsieur G. This is what Dupin is trying to say. And very usually when it is below. They have no variation of principle in the investigation. At best when urged by some unusual emergency. By some extraordinary reward. The only incentive that they had for uh, you know, for looking for that Pauline letter was the huge sum of money. They extend or exaggerate their old modes of practice. They never did anything new. They followed the same protocol which they had been following since ages. They had the master key uh, which with which they could open any door and that is what they were using to search for the letter. Without touching their principles, uh, what for example in this case of D has been done to vary the principle of action. They never did anything different. They never thought an out-of-the-box solution. What is all this boring and probing and sounding and scrutinizing with a microscope and dividing the surface of the building into registered square inches? What is it all but an exaggeration of the application of the one principle or set of principles of search which are based upon one set of notions regarding human ingenuity to which the prefect in the long routine of his duty has been accustomed. So basically, um, the prefect had been utilizing the same method for looking for things. And that is what he does in the case of Minister D as well. He never thinks what he should have done differently in order to solve the case. 
Jubin says that, do you not see, he has taken it for granted that all men proceed to conceal a letter, not exactly in a gimlet hole bored in a chair leg, but at least in some hole or corner suggested by the same tenor of thought, which would urge a man to secrete a letter in a gimlet hole bored in a chair leg. And do you not see also that such researches Researches refers to, you know, very rare or exotic nooks, spots for hiding, uh, for concealment are adapted only for ordinary occasions and would be adopted only by ordinary intellects. For in all cases of concealment, a disposal of the article concealed, a disposal of it in this research manner, very different or a rare manner, is in the very first instance presumable and presumed, and thus its discovery depends not at all upon the acumen, but altogether upon the mere care, patience and determination of the seekers, and where the case is of importance or what amounts to the same thing in palatial eyes, when the reward is of magnitude, the qualities in question have never been known to fall. So the method that was being used by Monsieur G, he would have, you know, succeeded with that method if the criminal would have been an ordinary person and the letter would have been purloined in very normal circumstances. So what he says is that the prefect had never dealt with the unusual kind of intelligence that the minister possessed. So he was uh, trying to look for the letter in the same places where he himself would have hid it. The problem with the Paris police is that they never adjust their approach. They only exaggerate it, right? They only extend it as they did by searching the house over and over again, by assuming that the letter can be found with something as basic as searching. But what mistake that they are committing over here is that they are completely disregarding the acumen, the skill of the criminal. Now, the level of cleverness of Minister D is something which fascinates Dupin. And this is the reason he took up the case. Dupin says, You will now understand what I meant in suggesting that had the following letter been hidden anywhere within the limits of the prefect's examination, in other words, had the principle of its concealment been comprehended with the principles of the prefect, if it would have been a normal person hiding a normal letter, the prefect would have... Uh, by this point of time, you know, procured that letter, got that letter. But since the case and the criminal involved was a person or a man with a superior intellect, this was the cause of the delay. Its discovery would have been a matter altogether beyond question. Prefect would have discovered it long back. This functionary, however, has been thoroughly mystified and the remote source of his defeat lies in the supposition, lies in the assumption, in the belief that the minister is a fool. This was the biggest mistake of Monsieur G, or the prefect of the Paris police, because he has acquired renown and is a poet. So because of the prejudices which were present in the mind of the prefect of the police regarding Minister D to be a fool, just because he was a poet and a mathematician, this was the reason he ends up underestimating his opponent. All fools are poet, this the prefect feels. So because the prefect used to consider the minister to be a fool, that was the reason of his failure. And he is merely guilty of a non distributive medai in thence inferring that all poets are fools. So the prefect had made the mistake of generalizing this statement that since a poet is a fool, he had equated that statement or generalized it that anybody who is a poet turns out to be a fool, which 
is completely incorrect in case of the minister but is this really the poet i asked there are two brothers i know and both have attained reputation in letters the minister i believe has written learnedly on differential calculus he is a mathematician and no poet so the narrator was a little bit confused because he did not know that the minister was both a poet as well as a mathematician you been clears out that doubt you are mistaken i know him well he is both the minister was both a poet he was also a mathematician as a poet and mathematician he would reason well he has certain reasoning skills he is intelligent as mere mathematician he could not have reasoned at all and thus would have been at the mercy of the prefect so had he been just a mathematician working on facts and figures and numbers probably the prefect would have been able to capture him when we attach the word poet uh, with the minister uh, he has that capacity of imagination right and uh, combined with those abilities he was able to come up with new ways of hiding hiding that letter you surprise me i said by these opinions which have been contradicted by the voice of the world you do not mean to set at not the well digested idea of centuries the mathematical reason has long been regarded as the reason par excellence so generally mathematicians are considered to be excellently uh, intelligent people but here what dupin had suggested was that had the minister just been a mathematician uh, he would have been caught but because he was a poet and a mathematician that gave him additional advantage chupinier tries to quote a french writer called as nicolas chamfort and the quote literally translates to you can bet on the fact that any idea and convention that is widely accepted is wrong for it is simply convenient to the greatest number so an idea has been propagated because it brings benefit and advantage to the greatest number but it's not necessary that the majority is always correct the mathematicians i grant you have done their best to promulgate the popular error to which you allude so they have actually propagated the popular belief that mathematicians are the greatest brains or intelligence out there and which is nonetheless an error for its promulgation as truth so when somebody peddles a statement to be truth without any basis one should completely refrain from alluding to it with an art worthy a better cause for example they have insinuated the term analysis into application to algebra so the analysis which they are good at can be referred to with relation to algebra but not always the french are the originators of this particular deception but if a term is of any importance if words derive any value from applicability then analysis conveys algebra about as much in latin ambitious implies ambition religio religion homines honesty a set of honorable men what dupin was trying to say is uh, that uh, he responds with a french phrase about how inconsequential an idea's popularity is just because it brings advantage to a certain group of people you have a quarrel on hand i see said i with some of the algebraists of paris but proceed so narrator is probably not on the same page with dupin and he believes that probably some mathematicians are going to be offended by this i dispute the validity and thus the value of that reason which is cultivated in any special form other than the abstractly logical i dispute in particular the reason induced by mathematical study the mathematics are a science of form and quantity mathematical reasoning is merely logic applied to observation upon form and quantity the great error lies in supposing that even truths of what is called pure algebra are abstract or general truths 
and this error is so egregious that I am confounded at the universality with which it has been received. Mathematical axioms are not axioms of general truth. What is true of relation of form and quantity is often grossly false in regard to morals, for example. In this latter science, it is very usually untrue that the exaggerated parts are equal to the whole. In chemistry also, the axiom fails. In the consideration of motive, it fails for two motives, each of a given value have not necessarily a value when united, equal to the sum of their values apart. There are numerous other mathematical truths which are only truths within the limits of relation. But the mathematician argues from his finite truths through habit as if they were of an absolutely general applicability as the world indeed imagines them to be. When we take up the example of chemistry, <clears throat> if I add any amount of salt to water, the weight of the resultant solution should increase, right? Uh, if we go by the axioms of mathematics, like 2 plus 2 is 4, right? So if we add salt to something as water, ultimately, if addition is happening, the weight of the solution that we ultimately end up with, it should having an increased weight, but it does not happen. So this brings us to the conclusion that there are certain truths in mathematics which are not applicable in other branches of learning. So this is why uh, the writer says that there are numerous other mathematical truths which are only truths within the limits of relation, only within one branch of learning. But he considers the mathematician to be arrogant and uh, the mathematician can argue from his finite truths through habit as if they were of an absolute general applicability as the world indeed imagines them to be. But mathematicians always talk about these rules and regulations which are applicable in their field of learning as general truths. But this is not uh, true always. Bryant in his very learned mythology mentions an analogous source of error when he says that although the pagan fables are not believed, yet we forget ourselves continually and make inferences from them as existing realities. Will the al with the algebraists, however, who are pagan themselves, the pagan fables are believed and inferences are made not so much through lapse of memory as though an unaccountable addling of the brains. So what Dupin tells is that uh, people more than often refer to mythology. Now mythology is uh, something which has been passed on from one generation to the generation by word of mouth uh, and there is uh, no concrete evidence of ever uh, those stories happening in reality. But people refer to those mythologies as if they actually existed and happened at some point of time or the other. So the mathematicians are somehow disillusioned in that manner. That is what he is trying to say. In short, I never yet encountered the mere mathematician who could be trusted out of equal roots or one who did not clandestinely hold it as a point of his faith that x squared plus px was absolutely and unconditionally equal to r. He talks about an equation. Say to one of these gentlemen by way of experiment, if you please, that you believe occasions may occur where x squared plus px is not altogether equal to q. Having made him understand what you mean, get out of his reach as speedily as convenient, for beyond doubt he will endeavor to knock you down. What Dupin tries to warn the narrator about is that mathematicians, the drawback of the mathematicians is that they believe blindly in formula and they never question a set formula, right? Like, they consider whatever formula they have been taught to be 100% correct. They don't think out of the box. So if you argue with a mathematician that a particular equation is, uh, the answer is going to be completely different, uh, they are not going to like it. 
I mean to say, continued Dubin, while I merely laughed at his last observations, that if the minister had been no more than a mathematician, the prefect would have been under no necessity of giving me this check. Okay, so here actually, uh, Dubin is uh, kind of complimenting or praising the minister in a veiled manner that if he would have been a mathematician, he would have or his mind would have worked according to a very set formula. Okay, uh, he would have uh, behaved in the exact same manner uh, as Monsieur G uh, was expecting him to behave, right? In a very uh, traditional manner, he would have hid that letter in the places where the prefect was looking for. But since the minister had the added advantage of being a poet besides being a mathematician, this was the reason why the prefect could never catch him. If uh, the minister D would have just been a mathematician, then Dupin would not have been able to earn that check because the prefect would have caught him very easily. He further says, <coughs> I knew him, however, as both mathematician and poet, and my measures were adapted to his capacity. So since Dupin knew that uh, minister D is both a mathematician and a poet, that is why he changed his way of looking for the letter in the same way sense with reference to the circumstances by which he was surrounded i knew him as a courtier too as a bold intriguant such a man i considered could not fall to be aware of the ordinary policial modes of action so he says that minister d was fully aware what the paris police was going to do right so keeping those things in mind he had hid the letter very ingeniously he could not have failed to anticipate he had already judged that is the meaning of the word anticipate and events have proved that he did not fail to anticipate so he had already judged what steps the paris police was going to take and he was 100 percent correct in those steps the wailings to which he was subjected uh, he was uh, you know stopped by the prefect for a physical search as well but they could never find the letter on him he must have foreseen i reflected the secret investigations of his premises in fact dupin believes that the minister already knew that the paris police uh, has a master key and in his absence they are going to search his premises his frequent absences from home at night, which were hailed by the prefect as certain aids to his success, I regarded only as ruses to afford opportunity for thorough search to the police and thus the sooner to impress them with the conviction to which G, in fact, did finally arrive, the conviction that the letter was not upon the premises. So what Dupin here tries to explain to the narrator, his friend, was that uh, the minister was completely aware what the Paris police was ultimately going to do, okay, and uh, uh, the act of minister not being at home, this was something which the prefect was counting at his advantage like the prefect believed that since the minister uh, used to be out of his home for long durations that is why we were able to search him but it was not uh, the prefect's advantage it was actually a kind of ruse a kind of a uh, plan uh, made by the minister what he had done was that uh, he had given uh, the paris police ample opportunity to look for the letter in his premises and in fact they had searched his house th so thoroughly that they had come to the conclusion that the letter was not on the premises but Dupin which he'll reveal later that the letter was on the premises itself so the absence of the minister from his home for long durations at night was a deliberate effort made by the minister in order to fool the Parisian police I felt also that the whole train of thought which I was at some pains in detailing to you just now concerning the invariable principle of policial acts, action in searches of articles concealed, I felt that this whole train of thought would necessarily pass to the mind of the minister. Right. So uh, just like Dupin knows how the Paris police acts, the minister also had that same knowledge. And what he did was that he worked his way around that. 
it would imperatively lead him to despise all the ordinary nooks of concealment since he knew what the paris police were ultimately going to do that is why he did not hide it in uh, the places where the prefect was you know uh, like assuming him to hide the letter he could not i reflected be so weak as to not see that the most intricate and remote recesses of his hotel would be as open as his commonest closest closets to the eyes to the probes to the gimlets and to the microscopes of the prefect he uh, the uh, sorry dubin says that the minister knew how uh, you know observant and how thorough searches the paris police does so he never used those places to hide the letter i saw in fine that he would be driven as a matter of course to simplicity so the solution which the minister had come up with to hide the letter was that it needs to be done in the most simplest possible manner and what the minister ultimately ends up doing is that he hides the letter in plain sight like it was so out in the open that it actually ended up fooling the prefect if not deliberately induced to as a matter of choice you will remember perhaps how desperately the prefect laughed when i suggested upon our first interview that it was just possible this mystery troubled him so much on account of its being so very self evident so the prefect could never think of it that the minister would have kept the letter out in the open because he had searched th- so thoroughly into the nooks and crannies of the residence of minister that he was convinced that the letter was not on the premises but on the contrary the letter was on the premises yes said i i remember his merriment well i really thought he would have fallen into convulsions so the prefect had actually made fun of this uh, proposition when dupin had said so that you know uh, he must have hidden it in the most simplest possible manner and uh, the minister could not believe that such a thing could be done the material world continued dupin abounds with very strict analogies to the immaterial and thus some color of truth has been given to the rhetorical dogma that metaphor or simile may be made to strengthen an argument as well as to embellish a description the principle of vis inertiae for example seems to be identical in physics and metaphysics it is not more true in the former that a large body is with more difficulty set in motion than a smaller one and that its subsequent momentum is commensurate with this difficulty than it is in the latter that intellects of the vast capacity while more forcible more constant and more eventful in their movements than those of the inferior grade are yet the less readily moved and more embarrassed and full of hesitation in the first few steps of their progress again have you ever noticed which of the street signs over the shop doors are the most attractive of attention i have never given the matter a thought i said now uh, dupin reminds the readers how the prefect had uh, you know made fun of the situation about the riddle being too self evident okay dupin lets everybody know that he believes that the material world and the metaphorical world are very strongly connected and he uses two examples one example he says that the principle of inertia is the same in equ- uh, same or equal in physics as well as metaphysics the second example that he uses is that he talks about a puzzle or a game there is a game of puzzles he resumed which is played upon a map one party playing requires another to find a given word the name of a town river state or empire any word in short upon the mutely and perplexed surface of a chart uh, if you people remember uh, even all the readers you and me including have played this game where we used to take the world map and then uh, we used to ask our opponent to look for a word in the map if they are able to find it they get a point if they are unable to find it uh, the other player gets a point okay 
so a novice a novice is a person who is very new in the game generally seeks to embarrass his opponents by giving them the most minutely lettered names so a person who is very new at the game what they do is they look for the smallest uh, font uh, smallest words written, written on the maps and they give them that particular name to find it can be the name of a town it can be the name of a city dupin says but the adept meaning the experienced players what they do they select such words as stretch in large characters from one end of the chart to the other but those players who are very well experienced what they do is that they do not use small words because they know that the opponent is going to look for them very uh, minutely they're going to look for them uh, look for the small words but they choose words which are uh, splayed over the map from one end to the other and that is what misses from their eye now these like the overly large lettered signs and placards of the street escape observation by dint of being excessively obvious since it is so obvious the opponent misses it and here the physical oversight is precisely analogous with the moral inapprehension by which the intellect suffers to pass unnoticed those considerations which are too obtrusively and too palpably self evident so generally when we are looking for something something which is right in front of our eyes we tend to ignore it and we start to look things in places where we are never going to find them but this is a point it appears somewhat above or beneath the understanding of the prefect so this was what the prefect had actually missed okay now most people uh what they do is that they overlook the simple things which are right in front of them and they overcomplicate things this is what the prefect had done he never once thought it possible or probable or possible that the minister had deposited the letter immediately beneath the nose of the whole world by way of best preventing any portion of that world from perceiving it so dupin here you know lays the case open that the minister had never hid the letter so the prefect was actually searching for something which had never been hidden in the first place and it was kept so out in the open that the prefect completely misses it this brings us to the close of part 4 of this lecture this lecture will be continued in the next session